Hey guys, it's Dave. Welcome back to the channel. I hope you had a good long weekend if you're American or Canadian. Otherwise, hope you just had a good weekend. Today we have another edition of Space Industry Updates. Uh, the last one was pretty well received, so I figure I'm going to be doing these on probably about a bi-weekly basis going forward. I think that's a good amount of time to kind of let the news build up. So things to cover today include news around rocket, obviously intuitive machines, kind of the big headline story, Northrop Grumman, and a lot of others. Before we dive into that though, I hope you'll consider hitting that like and subscribe button if you haven't already. Every subscriber is very much appreciated. And I also wanted to just give a big thanks to Kieran for joining the channel membership. And we also got a recent super chat last video, very much appreciated. Okay, with that out of the way, let's dive into the space industry updates. So first up, we have Intuitive Machines, ticker symbol L-U-N-R, and it continued a wild run it's been having for the past week or so. Today, up over 50% in a single day absolutely massive and that's just the tip of the iceberg if you go back a few days further we're looking at moving from just over two dollars a share all the way to eleven dollars per share absolutely astronomical move in it, you hardly ever see anything like this mostly on the back of the news that their lunar lander has launched I find this a little puzzling because, to be honest, I think the launch was the most reliable part of the entire operation. It's on a Falcon 9. I really didn't expect much to go wrong with the launch. Uh, seems like the mission's still on track. They had a couple small hiccups, but overall the vehicle is still very healthy according to the company, which is good news. But they haven't actually attempted to land yet, so still a long way to go. And as we all know, or I guess many of us know, uh, the track record of lunar landers over the past year or two has not been great. Most recently we had the Peregrine lander from Astro Biotic, which is the other U.S. company trying to land on the moon and in failure. Now, Intuitive Machines is hoping to have more luck, but this is by no means something easy or that is just like a foregone conclusion that it will succeed from this point. So, yeah, I think when you're looking at a stock run up like this, this is where you get into FOMO territory and it's easy to get sucked in because you don't want to miss out on 50% plus gains in a single day, but I would be extremely cautious if you're looking at this investment, uh, especially because this chart looks nice, but if we zoom out a little bit further, you can see that Intuitive Machines went parabolic once before, right after going public, briefly spiking to $80 a share before crashing back down gradually. So it is nice to see a space back get back to the point where they went public. I mean, don't get me wrong, I am happy to see that, happy for the company, and I do hope they succeed. Uh, they are an interesting one, focusing on the moon, on NASA, NASA's Artemis program, going after a lot of those contracts, but I don't know if the right time to buy it is after a 5x within like a month. To me, that's very rarely the right time to buy a stock. Talking a little bit about the mission, though, because it is a very interesting mission, the Intuitive Machines IM-1 mission is a Nova C-class lander. It was encapsulated and scheduled for launch on February 5th. The launch was targeted for a window that opened no earlier than 12.57 a.m. Eastern Standard Time from Launch Complex 39A at NASA's Space Kennedy Center. So this mission did successfully launch on SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket on February 15th. It reached its intended orbit 48 minutes later and established the first communication with the lander at 1.59 a.m. The first commercial U.S. lander attempt, as I said previously, was from Astrobiotic that ended in failure after a problem with its propulsion tanks rupturing and losing fuel. So they ultimately did bring it back to Earth and have it destroyed in Earth's atmosphere. I wouldn't call that mission a complete failure, though. They did learn quite a lot. They were very open with their communications. We got some cool pictures and stuff, uh, but they didn't complete their mission of landing on the moon. So NASA is paying about $118 million for the delivery of six scientific payloads to the lunar surface, two intuitive machines, and in addition they are also carrying six small private payloads for companies and various organizations. After the failure last month, CEO Kearns did say that it wouldn't be a disaster if intuitive machines also failed. 
He said that we've always viewed these initial deliveries as a learning experience. In the last four years, we've had a small Israeli, Russian, and Indian landers all crashing into the moon. A commercially developed Japanese lander also did not land successfully. And most recently in August, we did have India finally succeed in landing on the moon in a soft touchdown. So congratulations to India on that one. And here's hoping that intuitive machines will be able to follow in their footsteps. The landing is expected to occur on Thursday at 4.49, February 22nd, at the moon's south pole in a region known as Malpert A. Intuitive did share some amazing pictures from the lander already, and I really just wanted to point them out to you because I think they're absolutely phenomenal. This one actually from SpaceX, the second stage of the Falcon 9, we can see the separation here as the lander reaches target orbit and will head off towards the moon. Next up, we have kind of a close up from on board the lander with a nice little shot of their logo, Columbia, NASA, US flag, and really just the earth in the background. Absolutely amazing shot. Uh, another lens style photo here from the lander as it leaves behind that Falcon 9 second stage booster with the earth in the background. And another one with the Earth in the background, the lens style photo, absolutely amazing shots, really love to see them. And I really love how these commercial companies are being so open and so quick to release images and share the results of their endeavors. Now, onto Rocket Lab, um, obviously a big position in my own portfolio. They have rebounded nicely, I would say, from the lows after they announced the recent capital raise. So nice for all those Rocket Lab shareholders. Personally, I'm now in the green, and uh, they've held up pretty well even today on a down day, all things considering. We did have a launch recently of Rocket Lab's Electron. They had a 100% mission success on Rocket Lab's 44th Electron launch. It was called On Closer Inspection for Astro Scale. It was a challenging launch because the spacecraft needed to rendezvous with a derelict upper stage rocket that's already in orbit to perform inspections and prepare for eventually being able to deorbit spacecraft debris. So instantaneous launch window, they had to deliver it exactly where it needed to go in order to be able to move in to this derelict stage and do the inspections. Pretty challenging launch and it sounds like it went off without a hitch. So congratulations to the Rocket Lab team on that. Obviously, orbital debris removal is very important for the future and sustainability of outer space and low Earth orbit. Continuing on, Rocket Lab just announced today that they are already planning their next launch for Electron. It will be for Cinespective. It's going to be the 45th launch of that vehicle to deploy an Earth imaging satellite. This mission will be called the Owl Night Long, continuing the Owl theme from their last launch. And the 14-day launch window opens on March 10th. Once again, lifting off from New Zealand. It's really nice to see that the cadence on Electron seems to be picking up after a slow start to the year. They seem like they're getting on a roll now. Now, if we look at the manifest for 2024, uh, we can see that five missions were on the manifest for Q1. I don't think we're going to hit that. We're looking at maybe March 10th for the third launch. And then, you know, there's two more. Maybe they could squeeze in one more, maybe not. Hopefully they can pick up some of the slack maybe in Q3 that only has three missions currently scheduled. But personally, I'm pretty happy with how quickly they announced this next launch after the previous one was a success. And that is actually not all for Rocket Lab because while they're doing all these launches and getting prepared for that, they're also bringing back a spacecraft that's already in orbit. I am, of course, talking about the Photon, which is hosting Varda's factory in space where they manufacture pharmaceuticals. This most recent mission as a test mark manufactured some HIV drugs and they've been waiting in orbit for months trying to get a permit from the FAA to return to Earth but they've been struggling to basically get permission to come back so all this time Rocket Lab has been operating that photon as it orbits the Earth. However, I'm pleased to tell you that they did finally get permission from the FAA and this Varda capsule is going to be re-entering 
and landing in the United States in Utah. The first of four engine burns has already been completed in order to bring the spacecraft safely home. Obviously good news for Varda, but this is also the first time that Rocket Lab will be bringing a capsule back to Earth, so they should learn a lot from that as well, potentially some learnings that they could take towards their own capsule, maybe a human rated capsule on Neutron in the future. Now, Utah won't host all Varda touchdowns. They've also recently announced a deal with Australia so that they can bring back some of their space factories to land in that country. So great to see this new capability Rocket Lab is demonstrating, and it'll be exciting to watch that re-entry happen. Okay, next up, we've got some exciting new pictures from Blue Origin. New Glenn ha is erect, <laughs> or has been erected. Um, now, we do have a few shots here from various people, NSF spaceflight. This one I thought was really cool at night, showing the booster standing upright. Now, this is a booster simulator, so it's a physical stand-in for flight ready rocket and it was recently hoisted vertical at Blue Origins Launch Complex 36 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Base in Florida. When fully stacked, the two-stage New Glenn rocket will stand over 320 feet tall and will be capable of launching 45 metric tons to low Earth orbit. Exciting progress, even though this is not flight hardware, they are making progress and it'll be excited to see Blue Origin finally launch the long-awaited rocket. Uh, this was a bit of a blow for Northrop Grumman that I really wasn't expecting. There was an announcement this week that the U.S. Space Force has canceled a multi-billion dollar program that was awarded previously to Northrop Grumman. The highly classified program, which was awarded in January of 2020, was called off due to an increased costs and schedule delays. People familiar with the decision told Bloomberg that there have been recurring difficulties in developing the satellite payloads, hence the program's termination. Currently, Northrop has a space segment backlog of $40.4 billion, which is expected to be reduced by about $2 billion with the cancellation of this contract. So obviously rough news for Northrop Grumman, but thinking about this in the bigger picture, I think it really just goes to show that, you know, old school big space is not like the safe bet that it used to be. You've got smaller new companies executing well on contracts they receive. And then you think about something like this or about how Boeing has really struggled with the commercial crew program. And I think it's not so simple anymore that the old school big space companies are safe and the new school you know more agile up and comers are more risky i would say you know that's no longer the case and it also seems like the government is no longer willing to tolerate those cost overruns and delays like they used to now that we have more of a commercial environment with a lot more competition and choices available which i think is a good thing for anyone who pays taxes and wants to see their tax dollars put to work. So who knows what will come of this if uh, the contract will be kind of reissued. Of course, I don't want to jump the gun and say that, you know, Northrop is incompetent or anything like that. Maybe this was an extremely challenging project. Maybe they had some extremely challenging requirements, but it just goes to show how the space industry is really evolving over the past few years. Uh, we also did get some interesting updates from Firefly Space. So if you remember a while back, their last launch did not reach its intended orbit, making their Alpha vehicle one for four in terms of successes. And we've been waiting a while to hear the reason behind the failure, and now we know. So... Firefly completed the flight data review for that flight and submitted the mishap investigation report to the FAA. The investigation determined the mishap was due to an error in the guidance navigation and control software algorithm that prevented the system from sending necessary pulse commands to the reaction control thrusters ahead of the stage two engine relight. So I do think this is probably best case scenario for Firefly. Obviously, a software issue should be easier to fix than a hardware issue. And I do hope that they'll be able to get back on the pad soon and continue launching their Alpha rocket. 
So yeah, I would say that that is good news for any Firefly fans out there. I think they do still have a bit to prove with their Alpha Rocket and that one for four record so far, but hopefully after this they can really get going on that rocket. Uh, another note here, I don't claim to be an expert on either of these companies, but it was notable that Ball Aerospace has become the new space and mission systems business of BAE Systems, so BAE acquiring Ball Aerospace. These are quite large companies in the space industry, and I did think it was worth a mention, adding a grand total of 5,200 U.S. employees, so a very large space company. Uh, just some quick notes from SpaceX. So they were going to try to launch three rockets within an eight-hour window, which is, you know, continued amazing performance and cadence from that Falcon 9 rocket as they go for a record-breaking year. Obviously, the fourth rocket being erected there is the Starship as we all eagerly await the next launch on that vehicle. And speaking of Starship launch, Elon did say that it is looking like it will launch in about three weeks. Um, I don't know why he's telling this to Yay or I, I, anyway, um, weird things happen on Twitter, <laughs> but I think Elon time three weeks could be more like five weeks. You never know, uh, still waiting to see a firm date on that and approval being given, but excited to see that it is coming up. I'm really looking forward to that third test launch of Starship. And, of course, Tori Bruno did speak at a recent conference talking about the Vulcan launch, which was flawless, according to him. And, yeah, no, basically it was flawless. I'm not going to argue with that. According to an article from Jeff Faust at spacenews.com, industry sources say a deal to sell ULA could come as soon as this month, which is pretty interesting news. The two leading prospective buyers are Blue Origin and private equity fund Cerberus Capital Management. Defense contractor Textron was also linked to sale discussions, but they're believed to be out of the running. So personally, I kind of hope this doesn't go to Blue Origin, just because bringing these two rockets under one roof with New Glenn, I think, um, you know, it reduces competition, really. It's one less rocket company out there. So I think for the sake of the industry and competition, you know, more separate companies is better. And of course, I don't know how much of an incentive Blue Origin will have to keep flying Vulcan, which is not reusable, as opposed to, you know, focusing on New Glenn, which is at least partially reusable. And of course, if you're asking why they would even consider it in that case, while ULA does have an extremely hefty backlog of very valuable government contracts, including in that NSSL program that I always like to talk about as being so valuable and so important. Uh, another piece of news here for anyone who follows OneWeb, UTELSAT has now scaled back plans for OneWeb's Gen 2 upgrade plan. After testing OneWeb Gen 2 technology last year, UTELSAT has been speaking to manufacturers about a constellation of around 300 satellites that could begin deployments as soon as 2025. Most of the 633 satellites in OneWeb's current generation were launched between 2020 and 2023, and the Constellation has a design life extending to around 2027 or 2028, so we're starting to close in when you talk about the timelines for manufacturing and getting those satellites launched. However, UTELSAT has decided to hold off on deploying these upgraded OneWeb broadband satellites to instead focus on adding continuity of service for customers with long-term contracts. So basically continuing service and not launching and saying it in a nice way as far as I can tell. This shaves off nearly one-third of the company's previous $4 billion budget for a second-generation constellation. The saga of OneWeb still continues with it changing hands and, uh, you know, it's definitely been an interesting constellation, I'll say that much. Also, a note from RFA. Now, this is not confirmed, and if you're not familiar with RFA, they are a German rocket startup looking to kind of kickstart and be a big part of a commercial European launch industry, which has lagged the American and, in some ways, <laughs> Kiwi launch industries. Um, so, Rocket Factory Osberg has stated that it is preparing a maiden flight of RFA-1 from the second quarter of 2020, 2024, previously stated that is. However, 
It will be launching out of a spaceport being constructed on a small island off the coast of Scotland. And as a part of this construction, there are consultations with local community groups and local community council. So the minutes from a local community council meeting were recently released, including a statement explaining that the facility would formally open between April and May, and that the RFA orbital launch is targeted for the last quarter of this year, which is obviously different than the company has said, where they're talking about Q2. So if this is true, it is a bit of a delay for RFA as they look to get their commercial European rocket off the ground. Personally, it's another launch I will be looking forward to with great interest. Finally, one other piece of news. I wasn't sure if I should even uh, address it, but there was a bit of a panic this past week around some intel that, that was leaked saying that Putin and Russia are thinking about deploying a nuclear anti-satellite technology, which would be not for targeting locations on the ground, but actually targeting satellites in the air. Not too sure why you would need nukes for this, but several news organizations described the Russian program as an anti-satellite nuclear weapon system that Russia is not currently operating in orbit but something they do want to deploy personally my thoughts on this are please don't <laughs> uh, i don't think we need any nukes in orbit we certainly don't need nukes testing anti-satellite weaponry in orbit it's just why why do we need that i i don't i don't agree <laughs> So that's all the news we have for you today. Let me know what you think about the latest updates from Rocket Lab, if you're happy with that launch cadence. If you do think New Glenn is going to launch this year, obviously how you feel about that massive run-up in the Intuitive Machine stock, it'll be definitely exciting to watch them land. I'm really looking forward to that one. And uh, yeah, let me know what stories I might have missed. There's always stuff I don't get to. There's no way to cover absolutely everything that goes on in the space industry, especially with an eye towards public companies. So let me know what else you thought was pretty interesting over the past two weeks down in the comments below. I'll be sure to check those out. And if you did enjoy this video, I do hope once again, you'll consider hitting subscribe if you haven't already. It really makes my day. And with that, I hope you have a great week. I will see you in the next video. Bye for now.